Welcome back to Market on Close. I'm Oliver Rennick. It is Friday, and we are watching the crude market. One man that I know is also watching crude today and every day is Bob Aicino. He's the founder and chief strategist at Path Trading Partners. Join us from CME. Bob, I'm looking at this chart for oil today. I can't get any answers on what happened at 10, 10, 30. Should I even bother asking? Yeah, I mean, I think, all right, so look, in terms of, why do people say look before they say something? <laughs> because I'm looking in at the chart, Bob. In terms of when the pop happened. And it's a spike. <laughs> in, terms of, in terms of when the pop happened, okay, it's sifting. We, we see this in other economic numbers with other securities that respond to those economic numbers. It took a little while for people to sift through that Michigan confidence number. I know, just bear with me for a okay. second. Most of that jump in the Michigan conference number came from the bottom third of the income spectrum. That bottom third of the in income spectrum had a huge jump in confidence, a huge jump in current conditions. Take that two steps further. Do they fly places or do they drive places? They drive places. Some of the refinery guys that I know, when I called and said, what is this? I know we were strong, but what is this? He goes, we're all talking about the gasoline demand right now hmm. and how that could spike beyond what we've seen. You combine that with the declining production in Venezuela that was out overnight, yeah. the numbers that we got out of the IEA in terms of Venezuela's production, and guys said, you know what, we better start buying and we better start hedging. Okay, so I like this answer, Bob, even though sometimes I doubt if everybody is as tuned in, as smart as you are, Mr. Aichino, you know, I can make sense of a couple <laughs> logic leaps because this is essentially mm -hmm about demand, right? This is a conversation that on yep. the one side is about what we know, which is crude production from shale companies in the US is rocking and rolling, baby. 10 to 11 million barrels a day. Yes, it is. No matter who says it, that's the expectation. That then is known, right? What might be a little bit less certain in this market is the demand side. So as we get transparency on the demand side, maybe that can put a bid despite all this production. The demand side is the speculative part of the crude oil trade yes. outside of flash events in terms of supply, like a Libyan pipeline being take over, taken over by rebels or something in Nigeria or something like that. Those yeah. are the sort of uh, baby black swans that we get on the supply side. The demand side is the speculative side. And if you're going to get vacationing on jets and cruises by middle class and upper class, and you're going to get driving trips out of that bottom third of the income the demand is not factored in at this point at this point so if that comes it's worth about what we saw today remember crude's only at 62.30 i mean it wasn't a mad we didn't go from we didn't go up to 80 here uh -huh. so it's not crazy it's kind of taking us back to where we were a couple of weeks ago which was reasonable given the supply and demand dynamics it was just that one day jump gets people going what the heck but when you look at the overall price level it's still not really that high yeah, and uh, Bob, I, I really like this. I'm breaking ground here mentally, Bob, because you know that every time we've been talking about this on a weekly basis, I kind of ask you the same thing, which is why doesn't oil uh, move lower even with as we get all these expectations for shale? I guess there's only so many times we can say 10 to 11 mer million barrels a day until it gets baked into the price. We also got the rig count here, Bob, and Canada is kind of dropping off a little bit. Yeah, and in the U.S., we're only up four, so we're back at 800. It's, it's nice to say that the rig counts have risen seven of eight weeks. But again, when you break that down, I mean, I told you this last time we talked uh, a couple of weeks ago, the entire six increase in rigs that we had was in the category that Baker Hughes counts as other. Yeah. So they were looking to be less productive rigs. They weren't Permian. They weren't Eagleford. They weren't Marcellus. They weren't any of the big shale basins. So they were other, so we don't expect a ton of production out of that. Now bring Venezuela back into the conversation. Down to 1.548, I believe, or 248 million barrels a day. Down 300,000 on average a year since 2016. Mm -hmm. so 600,000 since 2016 in declining production. That's about 80,000 more than we're adding per year in shale in terms of the decline. Number two, heavier crude now. The lighter crude is where they're suffering. Lighter crude is easier to sell. Heavier crude is less profitable. So what does that mean? That means an acceleration, an exponential deceleration of production yeah. because the heavier crude is less profitable, less money going into the existing crude production. So if OPEC is still committed, we're gonna start to get that 110, 120 compliance levels again that we see when there's disruption in terms of their cuts. So it's kind of, crude's probably priced 
right, Oliver. Okay, Bob, and just to clarify for viewers trying to make sense of the Baker Hughes recount number that we've got up on the screen, which is the total, the 800 are the ones that they specifically say are set and ready to drill yep. oil, just about for those uh, trying yep. to connect Bob's numbers to what they see on that data here. Bob, also, within this conversation about tariffs and the uh, outlook for geopolitics, I think it's interesting that you see the drop in the rig counts in Canada as well, because earlier this week, we were talking about central banks and the central bank in Canada sounded pretty dovish, a little bit of questions about their economy. Could that potentially translate into a supply side that maybe we get uh, a little bit of a bearish tilt uh, from Canada then, or bullish rather? Yeah, I believe so. I mean, you know, again, all of it comes down to financing at the end of the day. If there were to be any tighter conditions, that would be sort of not a death knell, but that'd be a real struggle for crude oil. So that's going to add to it. In terms of Canada, you know, Canada, in terms of their crude oil, and now that you're exempt, you know, uh, you, for some reason, I thought you were Canadian for a minute. Now that Canada is <laughs> exempt from the tariffs or any sort of tariffs, I believe NAFTA is actually going to get worked out. And I believe, you know, the, the WTI and Canadian sands are so tied together. Mm -hmm that they're neck and neck for the most part in terms of production dips and uh, peaks and valleys. Yeah. So it should end up being okay from that perspective. All right, great insight, eh? Bob Iacchino, the founder and chief strategist <laughs> at Path Trading Partners. Great to get some answers on oil before the end of the week. That move at 1030, I like Bob's explanation.